coming this afternoon. My name is Larry Landis. I'm director of the Special Collections and Archives Research Center. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this panel discussion uh, this afternoon. We have a great set of interdisciplinary panelists for you. And to talk about today's proceedings, I will turn the reins over to Jake Hamlin, who's the director of the Environmental Arts and Humanities Program in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, we got a great turnout for this particular event. Uh, I just want to say a few things to start off. First of all, I'm Jake Hamblin. Uh, I'm a historian of science. I'm very interested in nuclear issues. That's what I kind of write about. So I'm really interested in hearing what everybody here has to say. Um, and I'm interested in having, uh, also learning what you all have to say. I'll talk a little bit about, about the format in a moment. Uh, I want to say thank you to Larry for letting us uh, be in this space. It's a fantastic space. It's my favorite space on campus, for obvious reasons. It's beautiful. Uh, I want to say thank you to Ann Baby for, for coordinating this, and uh, I want to say thank you also to Carla Dottero for all of her work uh, in the Environmental Arts and Humanities uh, program. Uh, so, if you don't know already, uh, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, and there are lots of ways to remember that moment, and there are lots of ways to remember the nuclear era that that, that began, as I would argue. Um, what I wanted to do is to get people here from OSU together under the same roof to talk about the nuclear era um, from their own perspectives, not always a historical one, but just to think about what it means uh, from their particular dis disciplinary perspective. This summer, uh, SCARC, the Special Collections and Archives Research Center, Center thank you, <laughs> uh, is, uh, is going to have a, an exhibit uh, on the, the, I don't know exactly what we're calling it, uh, the nuclear age, or the nu nuclear stuff. I think this is a better time. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, uh, which is very natural because the bombings, of course, occurred in August 1945, so it will be a summer exhibit, but it will be going on for, for some time after that. So please do come check things out. We'll put some stuff out here for you as a, just a taster of that. There's going to be much more in the, in the exhibit. And that's something I say we. It's not me. It's a uh, special collection that's doing that. Uh, but I'm delighted that they are doing it. Uh, just to give you a sense of what we're doing here, um, Andy and I had a conversation, and I'll tell you Andy in a moment. Uh, Andy and I had a conversation over the summer about wouldn't it be great if all the people who are interested in nuclear things on campus actually would every once in a while get into the same room together. Uh, because it just doesn't happen uh, very often. And so that's what this is. Uh, we are going to bring together four different voices, and there are many more on campus, but four different voices from uh, four very different fields to discuss this issue. Uh, and so I'll just introduce them to you. That's what the format will be. Uh, they will each speak for, I've said, this is very specific, I've said speak for five to seven minutes, a very short period of time. Uh, just some perspective that you have. Uh, and we won't have any kind of question and answer right after each person speaks, but I would encourage you to give a, an applause after each person speaks. Uh, and then afterward, I'd like to get all of you involved in the conversation. So the first speaker is going to be Laurel Kinsel. I pronounced that right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, who uh, earned her PhD in occupational safety and ergonomics uh, in uh, 2002 from the University of Cincinnati and spent several years con conducting outreach at the Ignatius Wright Labor Education and Research Center at the U of O. And we don't hold that against you. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. uh, the research, as I understand, your research is on occupational and environmental exposure uh, to hazards such as chemicals and uh, electromagnetic fields and, and all kinds of things that you would think would be hazardous. Uh, and uh, one, one would think. Uh, Andy Klein is uh, our, our nuclear engineer health safety person. Uh, he earned his PhD in nuclear engineering at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, uh, in 1983. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were on loan, I love that term, to Idaho National Laboratory from 2005 to 2009. But otherwise, he's been at OSU for about three decades, working on nuclear systems uh, and analysis, as well as policy issues such as nuclear nonproliferation. Uh, we have Keith Baker over here, who comes to us from political science, uh, also comes to us from the UK. A number of you said he's got kind of an accent. It's true, he does. He's got an anecdotal hold against it. Uh, he got his PhD in local government in uh, 2008 from the University of Birmingham, not Birmingham, uh, Birmingham in the UK. Uh, your recent work, uh, 
uh, Keith is on governance right, and, and, and the nuclear industry, uh, including a recent comparison of four different states and their approaches to nuclear uh, power. And last, we'll have Linda Richards, uh, who got her PhD from OSU uh, in 2014, writing about the evolution of radiation protection uh, practices. And her research has taken her far and wide. She's, she's gone from interviewing uh, Diné people in the American Southwest to Vienna, Austria, to the archives of the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency. What's that? Because of you. She also is my former graduate student. <laughs> uh, so uh, at, at any event, can we say uh, a round of applause for all of them in advance? So uh, maybe we can start with Laurel, thanks. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you so much for creating this panel. This is pretty exciting, and it's a great idea. I'm glad we connected and got all the nuclear people together. Um, you're the nuclear specialist. Um, so uh, my area is occupational health and safety. I'm in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences here at Oregon State University, which was just recently accredited. So we've been a growing uh, college with many different areas. And um, I'm in a particular program, Environmental and Occupational Health. So um, I have focused uh, most of my research in understanding kind of what exposures are and in occupational settings, generally the exposures are much higher in environmental settings because the people are um, usually working with whatever it is that is uh, being produced or, or manufactured or well, worked with. Um, and so it is a way to understand health and, and studies. And so um, some of the work that I think brought me here today was um, prior to coming to Oregon State University, I worked on a research fellowship with um, a person who uh, is the radiation cancer expert um, in Europe. And um, uh, she had a study, was very interested in looking at the occupational exposures to electromagnetic fields and needed somebody to run a study to look at brain cancer. And um, this particular study came from a, a, a case control study, meaning a study of people who had brain cancer and those who didn't, um, and they're looking at their cell phone use. Um, so you've probably heard in the news quite a bit. So this is dealing with non-ionizing radiation, which is somewhat different than um, the nuclear radiation that you're talking about, which um, has no health effects, which I'm sure uh, all are aware of. Uh, but non-ionizing radiation, there's still many unknowns, and um, trying to increase our ability to understand those exposures and relate them in big population level studies is the only way we can get at, tease out that effect of um, what that exposure is with that health. And so um, we've been working hard to develop those um, exposure algorithms and to run the epidemiological studies, which is allowing us to have a little more understanding and again, um, I was more in the side of the occupational exposures where the people are much closer to the sources of electromagnetic fields. Um, and there's a lot of variation um, uh, in measuring those with depending on the wavelength of the energy, which is the difference between non-ionizing and ionizing, and really understanding that. Um, but it is ubiquitous. We have um, electrical sources all around us. Um, radio waves, um, microwaves, and such, and um, I think it's very important that we understand the health effects and um, do the, the right thing to control them in the appropriate manners. And um, I have had the fortune of working, and I was just talking right before this, kind of the differences in the different industries and the different cultures, and it's very interesting um, to understand how people do protect themselves and provide the safety um, not only for the people working with it, but for the population at large and communities that um, are around them. Um, so uh, we understand from all these tragedies, the Hiroshima and other just even industrial tragedies, kind of what can happen when nuclear um, disasters happen. And, um, and even as close as uh, Japan recently and uh, feeling the effects here in Oregon as, as the exposures over time um, change. And how do we how do we work on that? So those are kind of um, what brings um, our college, and our college has um, all the social and behavioral. So we do look at the social determinants of health as well as the environmental and occupational, which is my side, an epidemiologist and biostatistician. So I do hope we in these environmental humanities can uh, have more conversations. 
did not plan this, but it's great. Uh, and so, as the ship approached, the cheery message was received, welcoming her to England, to England, and asking permission to come aboard for a spot of tea in the wardroom and a briefing on some local customs. That's a friendly gesture, thought the ship's captain, and he invited the visitor aboard. Same procedure was applied to the next U.S. visitor, and it was very warm and friendly, until Rick I found out about it. You damn fools, he roared. Don't you know what you've done? You've established a precedent that we can't bring a nuclear warship into a British port without first admitting a boarding party. We fought a war over that. What do you think the War of 1812 was about? <laughs> Precisely that issue. And now you guys have just given it all away. In vain, the captains argued that it was very harmless and, and the like. Nobody tried to inspect the reactor because the crew the Ricker were brushed all that aside and said, They've taken the first and biggest step in that direction. They've established the right to board our warship warships. The first guy who refuses now is going to cause a scene. You guys never think in historical terms. Damn it, you've got to keep the big picture in mind all the time. I'm going to go. Thank you. Thank you. OK, well, I'm Kid Bacon from the College of Liberal Arts and uh, Public Policy, which is fairly new um, to public policy, which is fairly new within the university. Very much a growing program. Very, very strong environmental policy, energy policy, water management, sort of the areas that are very, very relevant to nuclear energy. There's, we're doing a lot of work on climate change at the moment. Now, I'm a political scientist, public administrator by training. So, I'm and Rick over, and I was amused by um, British. We are that devious. <laughs> but, um, it'd probably been very well planned out. <laughs> but my main interest is sort of the current nuclear renaissance. The, the idea that nuclear power was going to resurge because it was a low carbon form of energy. And I spent six years and still carrying on with the research looking at nuclear energy in four different countries across the United States, in Britain, in France, and Finland. And I was think, struggling to sum up six years worth of research. And I came up with, with this. They're too expensive to build, too expensive to run, too expensive to dismantle. And, <laughs> and curiously, yeah, enough, that's my thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> curiously enough, I heard that story not from government officials, but from the people who were supposed to invest in them. Yeah. Actually, from the industry, and the, not the nuclear industry, but the financial industry. They didn't want anything to do with nuclear power. They basically were saying the government has to subsidise it if you want nuclear power. The government, or I suppose were, oh no, industry can do it. And the industry was not going to do it unless government chucks money at it. And it was really curious to hear the finance people saying it's too expensive. It's too difficult, it's too hard. And they seemed to come to that conclusion because there was always a cheaper fuel. And I, I think back to what uh, an old professor of mine said when everyone starts looking at nuclear power, they're either agnostic or for it. By the time they've finished it, they're either agnostic or opposed. <laughs> and, now I, and now I'm agnostic. <laughs> I, I don't know where I sit on it anymore, and is it a good idea? I don't know. Does it have, is it low carbon? Yes, it is. Is it very expensive? Yes, it is. <laughs> and I'd be very interested to hear what, what everyone else's views are on nuclear energy, the engineering and the finance, and just what people think. So, that's it. So I really appreciate Dr. Klein talking about how precious the collections are here. I've studied and had the great honor to be able to study in this space because of 
Professor Hamlin and because of the wonderful staff at SCARC. And uh, when I was asked to speak here, eventually a poem came to me because of you and you. It's very difficult for me to say in five minutes what I really want to convey about all that I've learned here. So I have a poem. It's about six minutes long. <laughs> My poem is called The Day the Train Stopped. We were on our way to Hiroshima from Kyoto on the train. It was August in 2010, seven months before Fukushima. My group from the American University Nuclear Studies course had just been at the Kyoto Museum for World Peace. In the lower level of the museum, there were photos of U.S. atomic soldiers with cancers so severe, their bodies no longer recognizable as human, like the mutated children of Chernobyl, but only older, with legs and arms swollen to the size of giants. We should have a peace museum in America, I thought then. These pictures are also our stories. The museum would tell the stories of what the utopian dreams of radiation had brought. I know the early dreams. I share dreams just like them, too. Early physicists like Frederick Soddy and Adam Curie dreamed of their discovery being used to heal and to produce true access to medicine, energy, and wealth for the world's poor. As Soddy would say, to finally end the chasm between those who labored as slaves like miners and those who were privileged. He meant as well as I do. The train stops. I gaze out the window and think about how this belief was not only rhetoric, it was essential to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. Their wishes were then deployed by the U.N.'s technical experts. Radiation health safety is the linchpin, the science that would christen it safe. Kenneth Willard Libby said, of course our artificial radiation can be made safe. It just needs to be below natural background. The tangible Curie is lost in translation to rads, rams, sieverts, and millirems, dosed now based on models and assumptions. This sensible trope, unexamined beyond the realm of pro-nuclear experts, relentlessly repeated, below background, below background, below background is safe enough that is what they told the U.S. atomic soldiers, and it wasn't true then, nor is it true now. Yet, it is relentlessly repeated. Below background, below background, below background is safe enough. What do the numbers in milligrams mean to a Navajo elder watching her grandchild die, wasting away from Navajo neuropathy? How did this happen? The UN, a body created for peace, would use nuclear technology to heal what ails us, ending war with an equality that only slick technological fixes like research reactors, guided counters, and radioactive tracers could bring to backward nations. Our bodies, future bodies, were sacrificed by bodies like the UN and nation-state bodies in their hopes for peace, and hopes for contracts and sales. The train is still just sitting on the tracks. Soon we will move. Someone new with a suitcase will board, walk through our car, but I notice no one does. I think about how, over time, national security came to obscure bodily sovereignty. Most know nuclear war is inhuman, but nothing can quite be done to stop it. The technology spreads, and with it the ideas of my body and contamination as a small price to pay for my country, for the free world. As imperceptibly as the radiation, human rights become relegated to the state. I gaze out the window of the train. It was also achingly beautiful in Japan, but slowly I realized we were still stopped, but not to let anyone off or on. Why was the train stopped? No one knew. We were nowhere, it seemed. Not near a town or a village or a city or a station, just between places, and the time passed. Is the train broken down? There were no answers. I folded peace cranes while I waited. With each folded crane and crease, I thought about the Hibakusha, the atomic survivor testimonies I had heard, folding cranes for each person who spoke, each person or lost soul they mentioned. I am in the story with my origami folding. I think of the horror after the bombs fell, the survivors I listened to had spoken of their unimaginable memories, the people in the silence just whispers begging for water, holding their arms away from their bodies, walking as zombies as their skin fell off in tatters like Tibetan prayer flags flown too long. 
I know how this happened. I saw the documents. But why does it go on? I folded. We are still suspended on the train tracks. The others on the train were more impatient, complaining. Finally, the director of the Kyoto Museum for World Peace, Atsushi Fujioka, softly explained to us the reason for the delay. A suicide. Someone had jumped in front of our train and taken their own life. I folded, I folded, I folded. I folded for this person I did not know, but whose death screamed to me, wake up to the nightmare that so many are sleeping through. It was some time before I could speak. At Sushi, I said this means, we need to see the links between suicide and grief over a world that leads with nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons send the message, what is one life? When superpowers threaten the whole of existence. How do we heal these souls and end this? I keep holding peace cranes. All the survivors I met in Japan, the uranium miners, the atomic soldiers, the workers, the scientists, the children, the families, all souls taken thus far as generations of time spreads out are folded in my heart. Thank you.